And this led him to ask a question. And the question was, why do great companies fail? Why do they fail? And of course, there's a super easy answer for that, because they have bad managers. It's because of bad management. I mean, come on, you can like sleep through that for one time, it can happen once, but the next bunch of guys should probably know what they did to their, to their uh, predecessors. So Kristen says, no, it's not about bad management, because actually, at these companies, they had very good managers. They were knowing what they're doing, because they were listening closely to what their customers needed and asked for. So why do the companies fail then? And the answer to that is because disruption is a bad fit for established companies. And I'm going to explain that why. The basic, the core properties of a disruptive innovation make it very hard to fit it into a company. For example, disruptive innovations are simpler and they are cheaper than existing technology, but they are also lower performing. This means that your customers, they can't use them, or they just upfront don't want them. And I'm going to share a personal experience with you that's a little bit embarrassing because it basically tells that I'm a very bad fortune teller. So what happened is like if you go back 10 years, like to the pre-smartphone era, a friend of mine, he was super excited to show me his new phone. He had his new phone and he said, it's so amazing, it has a camera on it. And he, and he like ran around and he took snapshots everywhere and then we sat down at his computer and you had to connect this weird cable to his, his phone and it would take ages to download the photos. And when the photos were finally on the computer, they, they had a microscopic resolution and they were crap, they, they, blah. they looked so bad and I said, are you kidding me? I mean, sorry, this is shit. Nobody wants to use that. Who would ever care to use that? I said, this thing is never going to fly. Never, ever. <laughs> now, if we forward back to like 2010 or today, as it turns out, the only camera I am ever using is the camera on my phone. And there is an army of compact camera salesmen, and they are shuffling around in the desert of the broken compact camera market. And they're say saying something like, customer, <laughs> customer. <laughs> so the comp uh, compact camera market, it was erased by the smartphone industry. I mean, who, who could think of that? There are other property, uh, properties of disruptive innovation that make it very hard to embed. Because disruptive innovations, they will promise you lower margins, not higher profits. You do all the work to go up in the market, and what you get with a disruptive innovation initially is lower margins and not a higher profit. That doesn't go together well. They initially target insignificant markets, emerging markets, they may target markets that don't even exist at the time. So imagine the following thing. You go to the board, you want to pitch your awesome disruptive innovation project, and what you tell the board is, all right, guys, I want you to pour like half a million, maybe a million dollar into this super innovative product, uh, uh, project that I have. You're going to pour it in. We're going to work for like five years. Maybe it takes us 10 years. After three years, we maybe will find out that we just can't do it because we have no idea what we are doing. And compare, compare this pitch to, there is customer A, he wants us to do a feature, a new feature for our product, he will pay us $50,000 next week if we can finish by then. $50,000 now, huge potential, huge risk, is it really bad management to decide for $50,000 now? I don't know. There's another property about disruptive innovation that make it hard to embed, and that is that disruptive innovation does not come with a label. If you start an innovation product, project, you don't know if it is disruptive or not. Christensen, doesn't license disruptologists. He doesn't license any guys who come to your office and say, mm, 
Yeah, this project, 50 to 70 millions in five years. This is crap, don't do it. Doesn't work that way. To elaborate, there, because there's another thing that makes it very hard to uh, embed disruptive innovation, I'm going to talk about the human body. Now, the human body contains, as you hopefully know, a lot of organs. And what they do is they are there for a very deliberate reason, and the reason is to keep you alive. Great, we've learned something today. Now, if you look at companies, they happen to have departments, they happen to have teams, they, they happen to have individuals, employees working there. And they are there for a very deliberate reason, to service the customer and thus keep the company alive. Now imagine if I had the great idea, I want to embed this key card in my rib cage, right between my rib cage and my lungs, I would have serious health problems. Now, if you want to embed something into your company that doesn't fit there very well, you're going to have very serious health problems in your company. And this is where the theory of resource dependence strikes, because the theory of resource dependence says that customers effectively control what you can do or you can't do in your company. The theory of resource dependence says that managers basically don't have a job. It's the customer who decides anyway. So, if you want to embed a disruptive innovation, and remember what I told you before, you uh, your customers probably don't want it or they can't use it. If you want to disruptive, uh, embed such a thing in your company, you will actively hurt your company. All right. So, what can we do about it? Why can't we be Sony? I mean, they somehow did it, didn't they? They somehow went from repairing radios to selling PlayStation 4s. I want to do that as well. How can, <laughs> how can that be, be done? And uh, what I want to do is I want to share some of my experiences that I made um, by developing a Loa editor. Uh, now I work at a CMS vendor, but we also have this open source pro uh, project. And Last week, exactly one week ago, on October 1st, we released uh, the second version, the alpha version. And I want to share some of my experience with you. Now, Christensen actually has very sound advice on that topic and how to do disruptive innovation. And he says, found a startup. As simple as that. Don't do it in your organization, found a startup. And I'd happily sign that on the spot. If you can found a startup, do it. The thing here is that if your company, if anything like the company that I work at, we're no Git repository. We can't just happily fork out new projects, new companies all the time. You just can't do that for every innovation project. So what we decided to do is, or what I decided to do when I was asked to do a Loa editor inside of uh, Gentix, I decided to recreate a startup as thoroughly as possible. I didn't just go ahead and like invent new things and made stuff up. I read a book by Eric Ries that is called The Lean Startup. It's basically about startups. Uh, I'm tempted to say that it isn't, it's not the most amazing book in the world because it's not as well-researched as Christensen's book, but still it offers uh, a bunch of uh, sound advice, and there are two main points I want to share with you. And the first thing is about what we're going to build. The first thing is about the minimum viable product. Now, the minimum viable product is a fun thing because of the word minimal. There is a broad understanding of the term minimal. When I went to the board and I told them what I wanted our minimal Aloha editor to be, the minimal definition of our product, like everybody had an idea of what we need to put in there. So I went in there with a feature list of five features. I went out of the board meeting with a feature list of 120 features that we need to do in order to achieve the minimum viable product that isn't minimum anymore. So while I did my research for this talk, I stumbled upon a blog post by Ryan Ten, and he proposed to rename it to the barely viable product. And <laughs> I like that very much. It's like barely standing there on one leg. <laughs> And Petro, who is working with me on um, Aloha Editor, 
he, he proposed something. He said, yeah, because the minimum viable product should be something that you're barely embarrassed about when you put it out there. All right, now wait a second. <laughs> Why would I put something out there that I'm embarrassed with, with at all? I, I mean, that sounds like a really bad idea, does it? And the thing is, what we want to do is we want to establish a feedback loop with our customers or our potential customers or our potential markets. Now, how can we do that? And the answer is we don't want to build like the finished product. We don't want to pour five years of work or 10 years of work into our product and then just put it out there and then figure out nobody cares. Nobody cares for what we've created. That's why we're gonna wanna go very early and you'll potentially have bugs very early. Now, Eric Ries asks us for that reason to take a very scientific approach and taking a scientific approach means that you have to have a hypothesis and you're going to test against it. And in order to find out uh, uh, for, for example, a hypothesis could be who is our first customer? Who, uh, who could be your first customer? And I have a little story to share on that one. Because in 1991, HP, they created a very small disk drive. And that disk drive is called the Kitty Hawk drive. And they had a plan for the Kitty Hawk drive because they wanted to focus on the emerging PDA market. So that's classical disruptive innovation. They wanted to uh, focus on the PDA market, specifically the Apple Newton. In order to be a good fit for the PDAs, they had to make the disk drives very rugged, and they added a shock sensor, so that if you would drop your PDA and it hit the floor, the disk drive would move in a parking position, and no data was lost, and you could just pick it up and start working again. Now, while they were working on the drive and while they were working with Apple to get the Newton off the ground, um, there were console manuf manufacturers, video game console manufacturers, and they approached HP and they told them, ah, this thing looks awesome. We want to use it. It's a perfect match for our consoles. The thing is, all that ruggedness and the sensor makes it super, super expensive. And that's why we can't use it. Can't you make it like simpler and cheaper? So what HP basically did, it violated the basic properties of a disruptive innovation to be simpler, cheaper, but lower performing. They ignored the console manufacturers, and today we have the luxury of looking back and saying the Apple Newton was a total failure, nobody bought it, it never got off the ground, and this is why, like two or three years later, HP had to pull it from the market, and it was a huge loss. So what I want to say is, have a hypothesis about who is going to be your customer. That's a good first thing to have. And test your hypothesis. And Eric Ries suggests that we have a basic loop that's built like this, a build, measure, learn feedback loop. I think you all can imagine what the build part is about, so I'm going to skip that. The measure part is the part where you really test your hypothesis and try to figure out if it holds up. And in the learning part, you reincorporate that back into your product, and then you start over again. All right, so if your company, like my company, if, if, if they approach you and ask you to do an innovation project, if they ask you to do a disruptive innovation project, a potentially disruptive project, with all the knowledge you've got now, you know that this is probably going to be a very hard thing to do. And so what I suggest that you do is that you do what I did, and I asked for something. I asked for three points. And the first thing I ask for are scarce but secure resources. Now, when I went into the board meeting and I asked for scarce uh, resources, they were like, yeah, we sure as hell give, can give you scarce resources, no problem. Zero guys on the project. <laughs> um, why would I ask for scarce resources? Isn't that a, like a bad idea? Remember, what we want to build is the minimum viable project, uh, product. Now. If you have 20 te uh, people on that innovation team, you can't do a minimum viable product. What you're going to create with 20 people is the ultra gold-plated, huge, ugly product, not the minimum viable product. That's why you want to start with like one or two or three guys on a team. But there's a second part about this statement that is often overlooked, but it's more it's really, really important. Maybe, maybe it should be secure, but scarce resources. All right. And it's the secure part. 
because what normally happens, and I have lived through that, like, I don't know, countless times. I, I feel like it's been 500 times. When you start an innovation project in your company, you go on for one week, you go on for two weeks, you go on for three weeks, and after three weeks, something is bound to happen, and what is going to happen is either a good thing, a customer is ready to throw money in your face, but you need to stop what you're doing in order to catch it, or something bad is happening. Everything is falling apart as a huge customer. Either way, or both happening at once, either way, what is going to happen is that your project is going to get axed on the spot. You will not be able to continue your project. You will have to work on that other thing and abandon what you're doing now, regardless of how innovative it is. This is the power of resource dependence. So that's why we really need to emphasize to ask for secure resources. Now, the next thing is also very fun to ask because asking for independent development authority is basically asking permission for mutiny. What you want to do is, is that you and your team, your team is going to ask to be able to decide the minimum viable product. What features it is going to have, what design it is going to have, what contents are going to go up on the web page, how the web page is going to look like. All aspects of the minimum viable product are going to be decided by the team. Why? because you don't want to have like constant approval by the board and go back and forth ping pong all day long. Startups don't do that. If they want to change something, they change, that, change it. And if they're not happy with the change, they change it back. They don't go running and ask for approval all the time. So why should we do it? What I'm not saying is that you shouldn't get like uh, uh, feedback. Of course, you should go show your stuff to people and ask for feedback. But you and your team, you are the ones who decide what is going into your project and how it looks like. And once you have independent development authority, you're easily going to have that. Because all the eyes in your company are going to be on you. You ask to do something independently, and if you're granted with it, you're going to have personal stakes. A stake. Yeah, personal stakes would be also great. Uh, <laughs> You're going to have personal stake. Why did I put this up here? Because you also have to make sure that there is personal stake involved for everyone who is on the project. And personal stake means they need to be in it with all of their heart, 100%. If you just have like two guys on a team or three guys on a team, you can't afford someone who is just sitting there and, uh, is it six already? Can I go home now? It just it's not going to work this way. We, remember, we want to recreate a startup. And that's basically the approach that we took for creating the newest version of Aloha Editor. Now, I'm about to wrap up my talk, but I want to share one last story with you, and it is the story of Sputnik. On October the 4th, in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, and at the APL in the USA, the Advanced Physics Laboratory, um, two guys, one named Geyer, the other Weifenbach, two scientists in their mid-twenties, real nerds, they just heard it on the radio. Oh, there's a cell light up there. And they were really excited about the news. They were like, woohoo, this is so cool, awesome. So they were sitting down in the office and they were discussing with each other because they knew that uh, the satellite would emit a 20 megahertz signal, a constant beeping. And they were asking around at their colleagues, and they figured out, we should be able to listen in on that thing. The Russians, oh, sorry, the, the Soviets, basically made it very easy to find because they wanted to make sure that nobody believes uh, that Sputnik is a hoax. <laughs> so they made it very easy to find, and they patched together some, uh, some equipment at the APL, did a little hacking session, and they had a receiver up and running in a few hours, and they were sitting in their office, people coming by, and they were listening to the signals from outer space. Imagine like 10 mid-20s sitting in an office listening to boo, boo, boo. Amazing. All right. So what they did is they listened to the signal, and then they noticed something. Because the signal would not always sound exactly the same. Sometimes it would be lower, sometimes it would be higher. And I mean, they're physicists, so they quickly figured it out, this must be the Doppler effect. We have a stationary antenna, 
a thing is flying by, this is the Doppler effect. So they th said, hmm, if we hear this, and if we know it's the Doppler effect, we can probably, like we know when it's closest, we know when it's approaching, when it's going away, we can calculate the speed at which the satellite is traveling. So they sat down, the, they threw some math at it, and like some hours later, they could uh, calculate the exact speed that Sputnik uh, was traveling at. All right, up to this point, now this was a little side project. It was not their job to do that, they just did it as a fun side project. But still, they asked to use the UNIVAC, the, the university's computer, you know, these old bulky things that fill a, a whole room, and they used it, and they worked on it for like three or four weeks, and what they did with this, it, it enabled them to map the exact trajectory, the orbit, that Sputnik was taking. And by that time, their boss, Frank McClure, um, it caught his attention, and so he called the guys to his office, and he said, as far as I understand it, you guys were able to figure out from a fixed position of the ground, our laboratory, you were able to pinpoint the exact trajectory uh, that Sputnik is taking. Now I have a question for you. Is it possible that we like turn this whole thing around if we have satellites up there and we know the position of these satellites, could it be that we like map, pinpoint an exact position on the surface of the Earth? And they think a little and throw back and forth some ideas and they say, yeah, that's actually easier than it is the other way around. <laughs> we can do that. And he's like, great, awesome, because I have these submarines in the ocean and with the nuclear warheads, and I want to point them at Moscow, and it's super hard to do that if you don't know where you are. <laughs> Yay! Cold War. Um, yeah, so, and this is like the basic story of how transit was created, which later evolved into GPS. It took another 30 years until Ronald Reagan made GPS an open thing, an open platform until Ronald Reagan made it available for the public. And I bet you guys that like, let me take a good hard look at you. All right, 99.5% of you are sitting here today and you have a device like this in your pocket that's able to understand what these satellites in outer space are talking, saying to us. And if you're anything like me, you used said device to find this venue today and this is possible because someone shared his ideas. So what I want to ask you is, if you do something innovative, if you have a great idea, then go out there and share it. Don't fight in the Cold War. Go to a conference, you're already doing the right thing. Share your ideas, because every time I did that, something amazing was bound to happen. And this is really everything I have to say today. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Clemens. Great talk, great talk, great talk. Now I'm, I really know what disruptive innovation is. Yeah, I, I said I'm going to test you afterwards. Yeah, yeah. All right, is everybody prepared for the short test we are having afterwards now? Very short.